Hello everyone, I'm Rex. This is test five. We're making good progress. Let's go. The Algazar restaurant was on Sheridan Road near Devon Avenue. It was long and narrow with tables for two along the walls and tables for four down the middle. The decoration was art modern, except for the series of murals depicting the four seasons and the sick ferns in the front window. Limey sat at the second sat down at the second table from the cash register and ordered his dinner. The history book, which he propped against the catsup and the glass sugar bowl, had been used by others before him. Blank pages front and back were filled with maps, drawings, dates, comic cartoons, and the organs of the body. Okay, also with names and messages no longer clear and never absolutely legible. On nearly every other page, there was some marginal notation, either in ink or in very hard pencil. And unless someone had upset a glass of water, the marks on page 177 were from tears. Okay, so nice description of this guy reading a book. While Limey read about the Peace of Paris, signed in the 30th of May 1814 between France and the Allied powers, his right hand managed again and again to bring food up to his mouth. Eating paragraph. Sometimes he chewed, sometimes he swallowed whole of the food that he had no idea he was eating. The Congress of Vienna met with some allowance for delays early in November on the same year, and all the powers engaged in the war on either side went sent plenty potentiaries. It was by far the most splendid and important assembly ever convoked to discuss and to determine the affairs of Europe. The Emperor of Russia, the King of Prussia, the Kings of Bavaria, Denmark, and Württemberg, all were present in person at the courts of the Emperor Francis I in the Austrian capital. When Limey put down his fork and began to count them off one by one on the fingers of his left hand, the waitress, whose name was Irma, the thought he was through eating and tried to take his plate away. Okay, so Irma makes an entrance here, kind of in a negative way. He stopped her. Prince Metternich, his right thumb, presided over the Congress, and Prince Talleyrand, the index finger, represented France. Cool. A party of four, two men and two women, came to the restaurant, all talking at once, and took possession of the, second, of the center table nearest Limey. The women had shingled hair. Shingled hair? What's shingled hair? Okay, shingled hair and short, tight skirts, which exposed the underside of their knees when they sat down. Their knees, how scandalous. One of the women had the face of a young boy, but disguised by one trick or another, rouge, lipstick, powder, wet bangs plastered against the high forehead, and a pair of long pendant, pendant? Isn't pendant with an A? Pendant, I guess, maybe not, earrings, to look like a woman of 35, which as a matter of fact, she was. The men were older. They laughed more than there seemed any occasion for while they were deciding between soup and shrimp cocktail and their laughter was too loud. Okay, so negative. But it was the women's voices, the terrible, not quite sober pitch of the women's voices which caused Limey to skip over two whole pages without knowing what was go on them. Negative still. Fortunately, he realized this and went back. Otherwise, he might never have known about the secret treaty concluded between England, France, and Austria when the pretensions of Prussia and Russia acting in concert seemed to threaten a renewal of the attack. The results of the Congress were stated clearly at the bottom of page 67 and at the top of page 68, but contrast, before Limey got halfway through them, a coat that he recognized as his father's was hung on the hook next to his chair. Limey closed the book and said, I didn't think you were coming. Okay. Time is probably no more unkind to sporting characters than it is to other people, but the physical decay, decay unsustained by respectability is somehow more noticeable. That's sad. Okay, so negative. Mr. Peter's hair was turning gray and his scalp showed through on top. He had lost weight also. He no longer filled out his clothes the way he used to. His color was poor and the flower had disappeared from his buttonhole. I don't know what that means. In his place was an American Legion button. Okay, so negative. Apparently he himself was not aware that there had been any change. He straightened his tie, negative, self-consciously when Irma handed him a menu. He gestured with it so that the two women at the next table would notice a diamond ring on the fourth finger of his right hand, both of the things and also the fact that his hands showed the signs of a manicurist. The manicurist one can blame on the young man who had his picture taken with a derby hat on the back of his head and also sitting with a girl in the curve of the moon. The young man who'd never for one second deserted Mr. Oh, the young man had never... For... So it's saying that he still acts like he's young. Okay. He was always there tugging at Mr. Peter's elbow, making him do things that were not becoming of, in a man of 45. Cool. I can relate to that. Over the course of the passage, the primary focus shifts from... He was like reading, and then it talks about people. Lime's inner thoughts to an observation made... It's not made by other characters. An exchange between strangers to a sad, it's not satisfying. This phys it was negative. The physical setting of the physical setting of the scene to different characters' personality traits. Mm. Limey's experience reading a book to descriptions. I think it's D because like I don't know about their personality traits in C. I, I know that like it was saying that some of them were like loud and stuff. But personality traits to me feels like it's going to give a little bit more of like a personal feeling. Like I would know kind of what their character is like. And I don't know at least like for the two men. And for Irma, like there were some characters that I feel like it didn't mention anything. And then for the woman and the dad, there was like some stuff, but I feel like D, if you pick C, then you're saying D can't be right. And uh, that, that makes me uncomfortable. Two, main purpose of the first paragraph is to, uh, I was talking about reading the book, right? 
Introduce the passage's main character by showing his I don't know if it was night. Indicate the date the passage, I don't know if it's a date. Convey the passage's setting by describing a place, it's the place, the restaurant in the book, see. Yeah. Foreshadow an event that, that's described, yeah, let's see. It can reasonably be inferred that Irma, the waitress, thinks Limey is through eating because, didn't it say in like the second column, right, with the contrast sentence? Yeah, she thought she, he was through eating. Uh, was it because he's not holding his fork, maybe? He put down his, yeah, it's okay. So it's C. Limey's primary impression of the party of four is that they are negative. So A looks pretty good. Refreshing is too positive. Resemble characters. This is too neutral. It's definitely A. Let's find a line that's talking about the party of four being noisy and distracting. 45, 47. The woman is shingled hair. No, that is not noisy and distracting. 47, 18, one that had the face of a young boy. It's not noisy. 55 to 59. But it was the woman's voices, the terrible, not quite sober pitch of the woman's voices that caused, it's probably that. 69. Limey closes the book. Yeah, it's C. The narrator indicates that Limey finally closes the history book because his dad arrives. I think it's A. Yeah, I just remember that from reading. It was another contrast sentence, I think. So the primary impression created by narrator's description of Mr. Peters in line 74, 79 is that he, 74, that was the first, okay, so that was the second to last paragraph, the first paragraph with his dad, where he was just talking about how he was like, he looked super old, and he he was no longer sustained by respectability either. Not menacing. No, I think it's D. I'm like pretty sure it's D. Eight. The main idea of the last paragraph is that Mr. Peters like acts like a young guy even though he's old. Behaves. Oh, B, C or D. Um, I don't know. Very conscious of symbols of wealth and power is true. I know it said that he had like a diamond ring or something, but then uh, that's like one symbol. This is multiple. I'm gonna say that it's eight B, and let's see if there's a anything oh that's not an evidence question so there we go they're not connected nine which choice best supports the conclusion that mr peters wants to attract attention okay so let's make sure we find one that says it quite clearly he was not aware that he himself okay so that's not about attracting attention 81 to 85 he straightened his tie self-consciously and when he gestured to the woman would notice that yeah it might be that 90 to 91 the young man had never deserted him i don't know what that has to do with attention unless you're inferring it but like we're supposed to use the line literally he was always there talking i think it's me 10, uh, line 93, becoming, it was not, be not becoming, it was not fitting or something, not fitting, let's go, B. Passage 1 is adapted from Catherine Beecher, essay on slavery and abolitionism, originally published in 1830, okay, who cares, sorry, <laughs> letters to Catherine Beecher, originally published in 1830, Grimke encouraged Southern women to oppose slavery publicly, Passage 1 is Be Beecher's response to Grimke's view, Okay, great. Heaven has appointed to one sex the superior and the other and to the other the subordinate station, and this without any reference to the character or conduct of either. So okay, so heaven made one better than the other. I have a guess for which one they're gonna say it is, but let's see. It is therefore as much for the dignity as it is for the interest of females in all respects to conform to the duties of this relation. But while women holds a subordinate relation in society to the others, oh big surprise. It's not because it was destined that her duties and her influence should be any less the the any the less important or all pervading. But it was designed that the mode of gaining influence and of exercising power should be altogether different. Oh, it's so interesting there. I thought they were going to go like way more negative about women. She she did say that they're subordinate, but she kind of said like they're just as important. They're just like different. A man may act in society by the collision of intellect and public debate. He may urge his measures by a sense of shame, by fear, and by personal interest. He may coerce by the combination of public sentiment. He may drive by physical force, and he does not outstep the boundaries of his sphere. So men can do all of these like forceful things. But all the power and all the conquests that are lawful to women are those only which appeal to the kindly, generous, peaceful, and benevolent principles. So again, like kind of another, it was like a weird contrast where it was kind of negative about women because it's excluding them from like being able to do all of these things that guys can do, but sort of said in a nicer way than it could have been, like uh, lining up with the first paragraph. I'm not saying it's nice. I'm just saying it's nice. It's bad. It's, it's nicer than it like the really bad. Okay. Woman is to win everything by peace and love, by making herself so much respected, esteemed, and loved that to yield to her opinions and gratify her wishes will be the free will offering of the heart. Yeah, the women have to do everything so nicely that you just want to like do what they say. But this is all to be accomplished in the domestic and social circle. 
Okay. There let everyone become so cultivated and refined in intellect that her taste and judgment will be respected. So benevolent in feeling and action that her motives will be reverenced. So unassuming and unambitious that the collision and competition will be banished. Okay, so, wow, this is a little bit uh, controversial. So gentle and easy to be entreated and that every heart will repose in her presence. Then the fathers, the husbands, and the sons will find an influence thrown around them to which they will yield not only willingly but proudly. Okay, so women, they have to like indirectly make men want to do what they what women want them to do. They can't do it like, they can't be upfront. <laughs> women may seek the aid of cooperation and combination among her own sex to insist in her appropriate offices of piety, charity, maternal, domestic duty. So piety is not something that guys have to do, but whatever, in any measure, throws a woman out of the, into the attitude of a combatant, either for herself or others, whatever binds her in party conflict, whatever obliges her in any way to exert coercive influences, throws her out of her appropriate sphere. Women can't fight. They can't do like combative things. If these general principles are correct, they're entirely opposed to the plan of arraying females in any abolition movement. Okay. All right. So we're just gonna we're just gonna move on to the next passage. Hopefully, this is a breath of fresh air. The investigation of the rights of the slaves has led me to a better understanding of my own. I found the anti-slavery cause to be the high school of morals in our land, the school in which human rights are more fully investigated and better understood and taught than in any other. Here are great fundamental principles uplifted and illuminated and from the central light rays innumerable stream all around. Nice. Positive. Here we go. Human beings have rights because they're moral beings and the rights of all men grow out, grow out of their moral nature. And as all men have the same moral nature, they have essentially the same rights. These rights may be wrested from the slave, but they cannot be alienated. His title to himself is as perfect now as is that of Lyman Beecher, who is famous minister and father of Catherine Beecher. Okay, It is stamped on his moral being, and it is like it imperishable. Now, if rights are founded on the nature of our moral being, then the mere circumstance of sex does not give to a man higher rights and responsibilities than to women. To suppose that it does would be to deny the self-evident truth that the physical constitution is the mere instrument of the moral nature. That's really well put. To suppose that it does would be to break up utterly the relations of the two natures and to reverse their functions, exalting the animal nature into a monarch and humbling the moral into a slave, making the former a proprietor and the latter its property. Woo. Well said, ma'am, sir ma'am well said person so yeah human beings value is derived from their moral from the moral qualities that they have and then so if you want to prioritize the natural condition of being like a like the of your body like being a man or a woman then you're ignoring the important part when human beings are regarded as moral beings, sex, instead of being enthroned upon the summit, administering upon rights and responsibilities, sinks into insignificance and nothingness. Okay, so your sex doesn't matter. My doctrine then is, is that whatever is, it is morally right for a man to do, it is morally right for a woman to do. Our duties originate not from difference of sex, but from the diversity of our relations in life, the various gifts and talents committed to our care, and the different eras in which we live. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. I like it. In passage one, Beecher makes which point about the status of women relative to that of men? They're worse, but like different, something like that. Depend on men for their safety and security, but they're largely, I don't think she said that. Like, I feel like that's an inference. Women are inferior to men, but women play a role as, signi as significant, it might be B. Women have fewer rights than men do, but women also have fewer responsibility. Maybe if they, hmm. Maybe we'll, we'll, I can see that this is paired, so it'll really help us like narrow it down. Women are superior, nope. Okay, so it's B or C, and then we just want to find one that matches very cleanly. Uh, the one where they're inferior to men. Well, let me hold this one. Okay, so I think that 11B and 12A work really well. I'm going to see if there are any pairs for 13C, uh, for 11C. Keeping in mind that like 11C Whatever it mentions better be backed up in 12's answer choice. And if it's not, then that's like a mismatch. There's holes in it, and so they can't be the right answer. So let, let's see, uh, 13 to 14. That's just, that's about men. 16 to 18, that's also about men. 41 to 46 seems a little too deep in the passage. Well, let's see. Whatever it anyway throws a woman into the attitude of a combatant, either for herself or others, is it's like not what she should do. Yeah, so there's no line that would match with 11C, so it's like 11B and 12A. 13, in passage 1, Beecher implies that women's effect on public life is largely... <laughs> it made me laugh, because he said it was like domestic and social only. It's like, okay, so 
implies that women's effect on public life is largely overlooked because few men are interested in, they never said that, indirect because women exert their influence within the home and family, it might be that, unnecessary because men are able to govern society themselves, no, he never said, he actually said they're just as important. It's symbolic because women tend to be, uh, be, yeah. 14, as used in line two, station most nearly means. So one sex is superior and the other the subordinate station, like position, something like that. Uh, rank, D, I was just plugging it in my head to make sure it sounds good. And which one is close to the word position that I targeted. Okay, so as used in line 12, peculiar most nearly means. Designed as a mode of gaining influence and exercise may actually be altogether different and peculiar. So which means it's in kind of like a good way. I don't think she's saying that it's like weird. So it's, I think it just means it's peculiar, like different. Like she even said different earlier in this sentence. So I feel like, like, yeah, eccentric would be kind of like weird. Surprising is kind of like, like it has a little bit more of a, I don't know, like a unexpected, forceful kind of <laughs> surprise tone to it, which I feel like is a little weird. Peculiar, distinct, I think it's C because it's really in line with that kind of, yeah, and they're just really different. Uh, what is Grimke's central claim in passage two? What was that? Oh, yeah, that's like, it doesn't matter if you're a guy or a girl. The right to interest or not to, okay, it's A. I mean, I should check them all, but must learn to work. Nope, too strong all, by the way, the must. Moral rights are the most, too strong, by the way, the most. Women should have equal, too strong, by the way, the should and the equal opportunities. I could see maybe like a D being a potential answer, but given how strong it is, like, I don't know if they literally said it. In passage two, Grimke makes which point about human rights? They're viewed differently in various cultures around the world. About human rights? Mm, I wanna see if we can find some answers, if we can narrow some down. So they're viewed differently in various cultures around the world. I'm not sure about the cultures part. I feel like that might be a little iffy. They retain the moral authority regardless of whether they're recognized by law. I don't know, they're, I'm not sure. There are sometimes at odds with moral responsibilities. Human rights are at odds with moral response. I don't think they, she said like, I don't think she said that they, they're in, they contest one another. Yeah, so I'm, I don't know about C. And they have become more advanced. Okay, so I think it's like B or C again. But again, we'll just try to see if there's a line that pairs. Keeping in mind that whatever we try to pair with 17 B or C, it's got to pair like perfectly everything. No holes, no mismatch, nothing. Uh, they retain their moral law. Okay, so that's B. Let's see if there's any pairs. Human beings have rights because they're moral beings. The rights of all men grow with their moral nature. I don't see anything about the law. 61 to 65. These rights may be wrested from the slave, but they cannot be alienated. It is titled to, is titled to himself as perfect now as it is stamped on his moral being. Oh, maybe? I, so I guess the law part would be like this, the reference to slavery because it was like an institution, but I feel like that's maybe a little iffy. So like if there's a better pair for... Uh, if there's a more literal, like more clear pair, then that's the one that I would prefer. But so far that seems like, like maybe. To suppose that it does would be to break up utterly the relations of the two natures and reverse their function, exalting the animal. Okay, so this has nothing to do with B. This also has nothing to do with C, 77 to 81. Human is regarded as one of the sex and sense of being a total sense of missing, sex and insignificance and nothing. Okay, so I'm pretty sure 17 is B now. And I think that the one that gives the closest possible evidence, the only one that I felt like made a, like a semi-clear allusion to the law was the, the slavery one, where you can like wrest it from the slave, but they, you can't really like alienate it from them. I'm gonna go with 18B, just for lack of a better option. 19, which choice best states the relationship between the two passages? Okay, passage two, I was checking the clock. I wanna make sure that this video doesn't run too long. So which choice best states the relationship between the two passages? Oh, uh, they're pretty opposite. Not practical difficulties probably be provides a historical context for this. This makes them sound like they're on the same side. Uh, elaborates on separate. That also makes them sound like same sense of B. Based on the passages, both authors would agree with which of the following claims. Women have moral duties and men often, it's not B. The ethical obligations of women are often undervalued. Political activism is as important for women. Okay, so it's like A or C because passage one wouldn't agree with C. Uh, passage one wouldn't agree with D and men work selflessly for political change. Passage two didn't say that. Men also, I don't think passage one said that either. They just said that men can work in the political sphere. So A or C, we wanna go with the one that we think is more true. Women have moral duties and responsibilities. So passage one would say like, yeah, they, their, their responsibility is to like be at home. And then passage two would say their responsibility is to behave in the matter that is appropriate for all humans. So I think it is A. Ethical obligations of women are often undervalued. 
Passage One might have implied that by saying that, like, you know, no, woman is actually just as important because then, then I suppose you could you could infer and be like, oh, like he's saying that in response to other people saying that they're not important, but he never said it himself. So a Beecher would most likely have reacted to line 65, 68. Now with passage of passage two. So how would first person feel about now if rights are founded in the nature of the mere segment of sex does not go? Oh, she would like totally disagree. So A and B are dead. Uh, C or D? She, she, she feels women actually have a more, no, disagree. She feels the nature of it. Yeah, so D. When it comes to energy, everyone loves efficiency. Cutting energy waste is one of the goals that both sides of the political divide can agree on, even if they sometimes diverge on how best to get there. Energy efficiency allows us to get more out of there? Oh, I forgot how to read. You have to go to the next line, Rex. Energy efficiently allows us to get more out of our given resources, which is good for the economy and mostly good for the environment as well. In an increasingly hot and crowded world, the only sustainable way to live is to get more out of less. Every environmentalist would agree. Make sure when you're done reading one line, you go to the next line, not back to the one that you just read. Okay. But change the conversation to food and suddenly efficiency doesn't look good. No, oh, sudden negative pivot. Conventional industrial agriculture has become incredibly efficient on a simple land to food basis. Thanks to fertilizer. Well, that was a weird positive pivot. So it was like back to back whiplash, tone whip. So it started negative, went positive. Thanks to fertilizers, mechanization and irrigation, each American farmer feeds over 155 people worldwide. Conventional farming gets more and more crop per square foot of cultivated land, over 170 bushels of corn per acre in Iowa, for example, which can make less ter territory needs which can mean less territory needs to be converted from wilderness to farmland. And since a third of the planet is already used for agriculture, destroying forests and other wild habitats along the way, anything that could help us produce more food on less land would seem to be good for the environment. So it looked like it was going to be a negative paragraph, pivoted on the second sentence to positive, stayed that way. Of course, that's not how most environmentalists regard their arugula. Negative, maybe? We'll see. They've embraced organic food as, never mind, positive and healthier and tastier too than the stuff produced by agricultural corporations. Environmentalists disdain the enormous amounts of energy needed to waste. Okay, so this is actually kind of both? Well, well uh, I'll explain it in a second. So, environmentalists disdain the enormous amounts of energy needed and the waste created by conventional farming, while organic practices foregoing artificial fertilizers and chemical pesticides are considered far more sustainable. Sales of organic food rose 7.7% 7 .7 in 2010, up to 26.7 billion. And people are making those purchases for their consciences as much as it tastes but so i thought it was negative first because i thought that they were going to go negative about conventional agriculture but then like it started to go positive about organic farming and then also went con negative about conventional agriculture so this paragraph was both of them positive and negative depending on uh, like which point of view you're taking uh, yet a meta-analysis in nature does the math and comes to a hard conclusion. Organic farming yields 25% fewer crops on average than conventional agriculture. More land negative. More land is therefore needed to pr produce fewer crops. That means organic farming may not be as good for the planet as we think. Okay, good. In the nature analysis, scientists from McGill University in Montreal and the University of Minnesota performed an analysis of 66 studies comparing the conventional and organic methods across 34 different crop species. From fruity grain, from fruits to grain, fruity grains, from fruits to grains to legumes. Ooh, fruity grain sounds weird. They found that organic farming delivered a lower yield for every crop type, though the disparity varied widely. So organic worse. Uh, for rainwater legume crops like beans and perennial crops like fruit trees, organic trailed conventional agriculture by just 5%. Yet for major cereal crops like corn or wheat, as well as most vegetables, all of which produce all of which provide the, the bulk of the world's calories, conventional agriculture outperformed organics by more than 25%. Okay, so from like an efficiency standpoint, conventional good, organic not as good. The main difference is nitrogen, the chemical key to plant growth. Conventional agriculture makes use of 171 million metric tons of synthetic fertilizer each year, and all that nitrogen enables much faster plant growth than the slower release of nitrogen from the compost or cover crops used in organic farming. So nitrogen paragraph so far kind of positive. Even when we, talk about a green when we talk about a green revolution, we really mean a nitrogen revolution along with a lot of water. Okay, cool. But not all nitrogen used in conventional fertilizer ends up in crops. Much of it ends up running off the soil into the oceans, creating vast polluted dead zones. We are already putting more nitrogen into the soil than the planet can stand over the long term. And conventional agriculture also depends heavily on chemical pesticides, which can have unintended side effects. So nice. We had a back-to-back -back positive nitrogen paragraph and now a negative nitrogen paragraph. So pretty easy to keep a mental note of. What that means is that while conventional agriculture is more efficient, sometimes much more efficient than organic farming, there are trade off trade offs with each. Trade offs? Shouldn't it be trades off? My English teacher, I remember a long time ago, told me that when you have like a, a two part word, then the important word, like the first word, usually is the one that gets pluralized. 
like brother-in-law is like brothers-in-law, but anyway. So an ideal global agriculture system in the views of the study's authors may borrow the best from both systems as Jonathan Foley from the University of Minnesota explained. Okay, so they're saying that they're trade-up plus and minus, they both have good and bad things. The bottom line, today's organic farming practices are probably best deployed in fruit and vegetable farms where growing nutrition, not just bulk, bulk calories, is the primary goal. But for de delivering sheer calories, especially in our staple crops of wheat, rice, maize, soybeans, and so on, conventional farming have the conventional farms have the advantage right now. Looking forward, I think we'll need to deploy different kinds of practices, especially new mixed approaches that take the best of organic and conventional farming systems where they are best suited you. Okay, so we want to employ both. Nice, interesting informative paragraph and crazy looking graphs i'll bet they're not that weird we'll just we'll, we'll see what they ask about it 22 as used in line 14 simple mean 14 conventional industrial energy has become incredibly efficient in a simple land of food like just in terms of land of food i don't know what, what like a word for that just in terms of it so in a straightforward in a modest land of food in an unadorned land of food it's a, according to the passage, a significant attribute of conventional agriculture is its ability to, isn't it to make a lot of calories, I think. Produce a wide, it's not a variety, maximize. Like they said, they make a large quantity, but wide variety would mean that like, I, I have like tons of different types of fruits and veggies. Maximize the output of cultivated land, maybe. Satisfy the dietary need of the world's populations and lessen the, the necessary, lessen the necessity of nitrogen in plant growth. Significant attribute, is it, it's A or B, uh, sorry, it's B or C, I think. Maximize the output. Let's see if we can find evidence for it, like after line 14, before line 27. We can use the line rule here to our effect, to, to good, great effect. It's become incredibly efficient on single line. Thanks to the fertilizer mechanism, each farmer feeds over 150 pounds. One convention gets more and more proper, We're for the, which means less territory. Okay, so then, yeah, I think it might be the maximizing the crops one. Maximize the output of cultivated. Maybe satisfy the dietary needs of the world's population. It's said that they feed 155 people per farmer, but I don't. That doesn't mean that like there's no starvation. I think so. This it's like C is going to be an inference answer, which would make me better. 24. Which choice best reflects the perspective of environmentalists on conventional agriculture? They think organic's better, and they think convention is like worse for the environment or something. Just inferior fruits and vegetables detriment. Oh, okay. It's energy efficient and reduces the need to convert wilderness to. F it's like this is kind of like why it's useful to do annotations because the when I read that question, I was just kind of thinking into like what I would have written, and I remember reading that paragraph where it was like the one right before it was sort of like the. Uh, it said it started negative and then it went positive about conventional agriculture, and then the the one right after it was the one about environmentalists, where I was like, oh, it did like the positive and negative about so. It's like that's why tracking main ideas and tones is helpful. It's good for the right only in the short run. It, they never said C. It depletes critical resources. But okay, so C and D both have way too positive components in it. It's not how they're going to feel. It's energy efficient, reduces the need to convert wilderness into farm. No, they're negative. About it. I think it's it's going to be like A. Let's see if we can find one that provides the best evidence. Not just any evidence, the best. That is not how most environmentalists regard their arugula. I don't know what that has to do with that. 28 and 31. They have embraced organic foods is better for the planet and healthier and tastier too than the stuff for, so it's better for you and tastier. Maybe 31 to 35. Environmentalists disdain the enormous amounts of energy needed and waste created by conventional farming while organic practice foregoing artificial fertilizers and chemicals are considered far more sustainable. This one looks interesting because this that definitely had the um, that had the environment component, but I don't know if that had the inferior fruits and vegetables component. And so this lines up with what I was talking about earlier, where like if you pick an answer for 24, the evidence has to mention everything in it. I feel like 25C has some holes because it doesn't mention the inferior fruits and vegetables part. That would make this like a, like a not ideal answer choice. So between the two promising ones, I think B is better because it said that the, they're like healthier and the food is healthier and tastier, which I think is a clearer connection to inferior fruits and vegetables. 42 to 45. More land is therefore needed to produce fewer crops. That means organic farm may not be. Oh, this is bad about organic. So it's, we're, we're looking bad, bad for conventional stuff. So yeah, I think this is going to be A and uh, 25B. Let me just double check, make sure that was the right line. Yeah, I think so. Which statement best expresses a relationship between organic farming and conventional farming that's represented in the passage? 
they're both like good and bad. Though they're equal, that's definitely not a way extreme. They're equally, like exactly the same amount of sustainable. They said organic is less, I think. Both rely on artificial chemicals for pest control, but organic farmers use the chemicals sparingly in conjunction with, what is that? That's good, it's a different story, different passage. Both use nitrogen to encourage plant growth, but the nitrogen uses conventional farming concerns since that, they might've said that in the two, in one of the two nitrogen paragraphs. I think it was the first one. Both, oh, or the, I think it was both, maybe, I'm not sure. Both create a substantial amount of nitrogen runoff, but only the type of nitrogen found in fertilizers used in conventional farming can be dangerous. That's negative about organic farming if you say that both create a substantial amount. They said it creates a lot less. So I, I think it's gonna be C, but again, we just wanna, it's, it's, you know, it's, like, it's nice for the evidence questions to be set up the way that they are. It makes them really kind of easy to get right. Right, because like we could just have to find evidence that supports the answer. And if we rely really heavily on that, then it can, it won't steer us in the wrong way. So thirteen to fourteen, because it has become incredibly efficient. There's no nitrogen there. Okay, so I know that like this answer for twenty six C is talking about nitrogen. So it's going to be like in the nitrogen portion of the passage, which was towards the end. It was like the two bottom paragraphs of the first column of the second page. So it's there. <laughs> yeah. Nitrogen. Ends up in crop, much of it runs in creating vast. Okay, so synthetic fertilizer, so it makes these, it's like line 62-ish, I think. I think it's D. Let me just make sure there are no holes, no mismatch. Does it mention both? Yep, it mentions organic farming right at the end, so good. According to Foley, an ideal global agriculture system, isn't it gonna be like a trade-off system that takes like both or something? Focus primarily and considers multiple factors in the selection of farm, no, uh, maybe ways the economic interests of farmers are getting, it's not that. Put the nutritional needs, put the nutritional value of produce first and foremost. No, it said like, yeah, it, you, it's a trade-off, right? Like if you just wanna supply sheer calories then conventional is better, but if you're going for nutrition, then organic's better, so. B, I think. Line 88, sheer, oh, that was like sheer calories, wasn't it? Understatement. Delivering sheer, but for delivering just calories, like pure calories or something. Pure calories, let's go. All right, so D. Which statement is best supported by the information provided in figure one? Organic yield as a percentage of conventional yield is greater for vegetables than for fruits. Organic yield is similar for cereals and all crowds. Okay, so we have to just true false all of these, annoyingly. Organic yield as a percentage of conventional Yield is greater for vegetables than for fruits. Organic yields percentage of, at 100% the organic yield is the same as, oh, okay, so th this first figure is telling us that none of the organic yields are equal to conventional yields. Like for fruits, it gets kind of close, but then for every, it's still lower, and then for everything else, it's way lower, so. I don't think this one's gonna be A, where it's saying that it's greater for one of them. The organic yield as a percentage of conventional yield is similar for cereals and all crops. Cereals? All crops? Oh, because they're both like 70 something percent, so maybe. Uh, wrong question. The reported number of observations for each crop type yields exceeds 82. Where's observate? Oh, is it the thing in the box? Exce no, fruits is 14, so I think that's wrong. Organic yield as a percentage of conventional yield is greater for. No, I, I think it's uh, B because we already know that like yeah, yields lower. Which of the following claims is supported by figure two? Soybeans have the lowest yield. Soybeans do not have the lowest, they're like the, the highest. Organically grown maize and barley represented are comparable in their yields to conventionally grown. Organically grown maize and barley are similar to conventionally. That would mean it's on the line, so nothing's on the line there in figure two. Of the organically grown species represented, tomatoes have the highest yield. No, still soybeans. Organically grown species represent have lower yields in the, uh, oh, D, okay, great. The wisdom of crowds has become a mantra, mantra, over the internet age. Need to choose a new vacuum cleaner? Check out the reviews on online merch and Amazon. But a new study suggests that such online scores don't always reveal the best choice. A massive controlled experiment of web users finds that such ratings are highly susceptible to irrational herd behavior and that the herd can be manipulated. <laughs> Sometimes the crowd really is wider, wiser than you. The amount of times I've bought something based off of positive uh, Amazon reviews, 
yeah, I, I, I highly concur with what this passage is saying. Sometimes the crowd really is wiser than you. The classic examples are guessing the weight of a bull or the number of gumballs in a jar. So positive about crowd mentality here. Your guess is probably going to be far from the mark, whereas the average of many people's choices is remarkably close to the true number. Cool. But what happens when the goal is to judge something less tangible, such as the quality or worth of a product? So negative about crowd mentality. The previous one said you're good at like counting stuff. This one says you're bad with intangible things. According to one theory, the wisdom of the crowd still holds, um, it might say it's good. Measuring the aggregate of people's opinions produces a stable, reliable value. Skeptics, however, argue that people's opinions are easily swayed by those of others. So nudging a crowd early on by presenting contrary opinions, for example, exposing them to some very good or very bad attitudes, will steer the crowd in a different direction. To test which hypothesis is true, you would need to manipulate huge numbers of people, excuse me, exposing them to false information and determining how it affects their opinions. Okay, so they're, they're kind of on, on, some people say it's, oh, they're still good. Some people say that they're like not sure. A team led by Sinan, Sinan, Aral, Aral? Sinan Aral? A network scientist at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, ooh, MIT, did exactly that. Aral has been secretly work, sorry, Mr. Aral or Aral, has been secretly working with a popular website that aggregates news stories. The website allows users to make comments about news stories and vote each other's, each other's comments up or down. The vote tallies are visible as a number next to each comment and the position of the comments is chronological. Stories on the site get an average of about 10 comments and about three votes per comment. All methodologies so far. It's a follow-up to his experiment using people's ratings of motives to fit to measure how much an individual's people, in, how much individual people influence each other online. Answer is a lot. This time he wanted to know how much the crowd influences the individual and whether it can be controlled from the outside. Okay, so he's testing herd mentality. For five months, every comment submitted by a user randomly received an upvote positive, a downvote negative, or as a control, no vote at all. The team then observed how many users rated those comments. The users generated more than 100,000 comments that were reviewed more than 10 million times and rated more than 300,000 times by other. Okay, so another paragraph of methodology, but more specifically, I suppose, like the up and down voting system. At least when it comes to comments on news sites, the crowd is more heard like than why. So definitely heard like paragraph. Let's see what it says. Comments that receive fake positive votes from the researchers were 32% more likely to receive more positive votes compared with the control the team reports. Interesting. My Amazon experience concurs. And those contents were no, li no more likely than the control to be downvoted by the next viewer to see them. By the end of the study, positively manipulated comments got an overall boost of about 25%. However, the same did not hold true for negative manipulation. The ratings of comments that got a fake downvote were usually negated by an upvote by the next user to see them. Interesting. Our experiment does not reveal the psychology behind people's decisions, Errol says, but an intuitive explanation is that people are more skeptical of negative social influence. They're, they're more willing to go along with positive opinions from other people. Hmm. It's an interesting like, sociological principle there. Duncan Watts, a network scientist at Microsoft Research in New York City, argues, that, argues with that conclusion. But one question is whether positive herding bias is specific to the site or in general, Watts says. Okay, so he has a caveat. He's not sure if it's just like a... Amazon specific thing or whatever site they used. He points out that the category of the news items in the experiment had a strong effect on how much people could be manipulated. I would have thought that business is pretty similar to economics, yet they find a much stronger effect, almost 50% for the former than the latter. So business had a way stronger effect. What explains this? Business had a stronger bit, right? They find a much stronger effect for the, for yeah, former is first, okay. So what explains this difference? If we're going to apply these findings in the real world, we'll need to know the answers. Cool. Will companies be able to boost their products by manipulating online ratings on a massive scale? So let's see. That's easier said than done. Watts says if people learn, detect or learn that comments on a website are being manipulated, the herd may spook and leave entirely. So it doesn't end super positive. It's kind of on the fence, sort of on the fence pa passage. Over the course of the passage, the main focus shifts from a discussion of experiments and its results to, I don't know, like its implications or something. The explanation of practical, it's not practical. I don't think they're talking about using it like in literal real life situations. A consideration of questions prompt, it might be that. Analysis of the defect to negative disputes the results. Was it a conversation? How is that a, it's not a conversation. Like I don't know that they were talking to one another. Okay, I think that's gonna be a trap there. Like a mis an inaccuracy of wording. I think it's B. The author of the past suggests that crowds may be more effective at, oh, like the bubblegum jar thing versus the feelings, <laughs> intangible thing, creating controversy, reinforcing, maybe C, ranking others' opinions, then develop, yeah, I think it's C. Oh, 34 is here to save us, so if we find a line that matches perfectly with C, then we know we're right. 
arriving accurate quantitative answers than producing valid qualitative judgments. I think that's going to be second paragraph. Might be B. 17 to 20. The wisdom of the cost still holds measuring accurate people's opinions produces a stable, reliable. That's positive about the intangible stuff. So that, that would be like, that would say that they're good at the qualitative part, but 33C is talking about how we're better at the quantitative aspect of it, so the physical counting stuff. So that would be a mismatch with uh, 33C would mismatch with 34C. So I think 34 is B. Uh, 35, which choice best supports the views of the skeptics? Well, what's the views of the skeptics? They argue that people's opinions are easily swayed. So we have herd-like behavior. Let's find a line that talks about herd-like behavior. Fake, 32, more likely to receive more positive. That's pretty herd-like, but we'll check the rest. 58 to 60. And these comments are no more likely than the control to be downvoted by the next viewer to see them. So they're not, they're, they didn't do anything different from normal. I don't know if that's herd-like, because herd-like would mean that you like, you. You're like a lemming, right? Like you follow people off the cliff. Not you just keep doing what people usually do. 30, 63 to 65. I was saying did not hold true. Okay, so this is the opposite of what I'm looking for. That's like not herd-like behavior, I think. 76 to 79. Well, he points out the category of news that is the experience had a strong effect on how much people could be manipulated. I think it's A. Yeah. 36. Which action would best address a question Watts raises about the study? Watts was the guy at the end. Oh, he said it was like the contrast sentence, the second sentence, line 75. He's like, I don't know if it's just your site or it's everything. So maybe B, registering, no, informing users that voting to be <laughs> I think it's B. 37, as used in line 85, boost most nearly means. How many people to boost their products by, like, boost, like, boost. I, I don't know, I can't think of a word for that. Increase, I think it's that. Let me make sure they increase their product. Oh, actually, yeah, it might sound great. Accelerate, promote their product. Uh, interesting. I'm thinking it's A or C. Will companies be able to boost their products by manipulating online ratings on a massive scale? I don't know. See, the phrasing of increase their product sounds so fishy that I'm leaning towards the promote now. You don't accelerate products. Like we want to treat vocabulary and context questions as context questions. So like it, you don't want to pick the answer that sounds wrong, which is why like on the grammar section, I'm always like, oh, it's vocab. Just pick what sounds right. I think it's C because promoting products is something that you would do. 38, as used in line 86, scale most nearly means on a massive scale, scope, something like that. <sighs> I, I, I thought I was going to guess it there on a massive level wage internet uh, level. Yeah. Then yeah, in the figure, which category of news has an artificially upvoted mean score of 2.5 artificially upvoted commons, artificially upvoted mean score of 2.5. That's the line. So that politics. Okay. B I found the correct shape. According to the figure, which category of news shows the smallest difference in mean score between artificially upvoted comments and control? The smallest difference in mean score between artificially upvoted and control. Oh, between black and white dot, I think. General news, because they're like right next to one another, D. Data presented in the figure most directly support which idea from the passage? Um, I'm gonna read these and make sure. Let's see if I can't cross any out. So the mean score of the artificial downvoted comments is similar to that of control. Patterns observed in the experiment suggest that people are suspicious of negative. So I don't know if the graph says that. Positive bias observes observed in users of the news site may not apply to human behavior and other content. What is that? The type of story being commented on has an impact on the degree to which people. I think it's D. What was wrong with it? Why did I say A was a maybe? The mean score of artificially downvoted comments is similar to that of the control. Well, obviously not. Okay, I don't know why I kept that, but like they're they're quite different the way that the white dots track and the black dots track. So, yeah. So D. In 2000, a neuroscientist at University College London named Eleanor McGuire wanted to find out what effect, if any, all that driving around the labyrinthine streets of London might have on cabbies' brains. When she brought 16 taxi drivers into her lab and examined their brains in an MRI scanner, she found one surprising and important difference. The right posterior hippocampus, a part of the brain known to be involved in spatial navigation, was 7% larger than normal in the cabbies, a small but very significant difference. Interesting. McGuire concluded that all of that wayfinding around London had physically altered the gross structures of their brains. Oh, disgusting. 
disgusting structure. <laughs> it's not how she meant it, but the more years, the more years a cabbie had been on the road, the more pronounced the effect. Okay. The brain is a mutable organ capable within limits of reorganizing itself and readapting to new kinds of sensory input, a phenomenon known as neuroplasticity. It has long been thought that the adult brain was incapable of spawning new neurons, that while learning caused synapses to rearrange themselves and new links between brain and cells to form, the brain's basic anatomical structure is more or less static. McGuire's study suggested the old inherited wisdom was simply not true. Interesting. So learning that the brain is plastic. After her groundbreaking study of London cabbies, McGuire decided to turn her attention to mental athletes. She teamed up with Elizabeth Valentine and John Wilding. It's like fantasy character names authors of the academic monograph Superior Memory to study 10 individuals who had finished, finished near the top of World Memory Championship. They wanted to find out if the memorizers' brains were, like London cabbies, structurally different from the rest of ours, or if they were somehow just making better use of memory abilities that we all possess. The researchers put both mental athletes and a group of match control subjects into MRI scanners and asked them to memorize three-digit numbers, black and white photographs of people's faces, and magnified images of snowflakes while their brains were being scanned. So it looks like a methodology paragraph coming up based off of that sentence. McGuire and her team thought it was possible that they might discover anatomical differences in the brains of memory champs. Evidence that their brains had somehow reorganized themselves in the process of doing all that intensive remembering. But when the researchers reviewed their Im imaging data, so important sentence both because it's a contrast, but also because I think it's a finding sentence, not all significant structural difference, not a single significant structural difference showed up. Interesting, the brains of mental athletes appeared to be indistinguishable from those of the control subjects. What's more, on every single test of general cognitive ability, the mental athlete's score came back well within the normal range. The memory champs weren't smarter and they didn't have special brains. Hmm. There was one telling difference between the brains of the mental athletes and the control subjects. When the researchers looked at which parts of the brain were lighting up when the mental athletes were memorizing, they found that they were activating entirely different circuitry. Cool, so this is the difference, difference between the two categories of people. According to the functional MRIs, fMRI, Regions of the brain that were less active in the control subjects seemed to be working in overdrive for the mental athletes. Surprisingly, when the mental athletes were learning new information, they were engaging several regions of the brain known to be involved in two specific tasks, visual memory and spatial navigation, including the same right posterior hippocampal regions that the London cabbies had enlarged with all of their daily wayfinding. At first glance, this wouldn't seem to, be, to make any sense. Why would mental athletes be conjuring images in their mind's eye when they were trying to learn three-digit numbers? Why would they be navigating like London cabbies when they were supposed to be remembering the shapes of snowflakes? Good question. McGuire and her team asked the mental athletes to describe exactly what was going on through their minds as they memorized. The mental athletes said they were consciously converting the information they were being asked to memorize into images and distributing those images along familiar spatial journeys. They weren't doing this automatically or because it was an inborn talent they nurtured since childhood. Rather, the unexpected patterns of neural activity that McGuire fMRIs turned up were the result of training and practice. It's kind of cool. Take, take, I feel like that'd be like a hard skill to learn, but maybe useful. According to the passage, McGuire's findings regarding taxi drivers are significant because they demonstrate the validity of a new method. I don't know if it's a method. Provide evidence for a popular viewpoint. Mm, call into question the earlier consensus. Challenge the current office. It's not only it's D. I think it's like B or C. I don't remember. So let's see, 8 to 12. Just look for something that matches perfectly. Right? How's it like that one doesn't match with anything. So 8 to 12 to 16. Probably going to do that all that way from physically all the way. It doesn't say that either. Okay, great. So it's 17 to 20. The brain's immutable organ. Nope. 20 to 26. It had long been thought that it was in cave. Oh, it's this one, I think. Aha. Uh -huh. So they thought for a long time that it was like not plastic. So I think that this is going to match. This is the only one that's going to match remotely closely with 42C. So then I believe that's our answer. 44, as used in line 24, basic most nearly means. The brain's basic anatomical structure, like its fundamental structure. Oh my goodness, I'm on a roll, D. 45, which question was McGuire's study of mental athletes primarily intended to answer? What question was McGuire's study of <laughs> <laughs> it pro didn't process at all. I was still celebrating 44 in my head that I targeted it correctly. <laughs> Which question was McGuire's study of mental athletes primarily intended to answer? Study of mental athletes. Oh, are there brains like, are there brains like the London cabbies or something? Active memorization make use of different brain structures than the active navigation. Do mental athletes inherit their unusual brain structures or I don't know if it's inherit. 
the hair part's weird. Does heightened memorization ability reflect abnormal brain structure and unusual use of brain's normal brain structure? Well, maybe. What's the relationship between general cognitive ability and the unusual general cognitive ability? I don't think it's that. I think it's A or C. A to me had a little bit of a weird feeling though, because like A isn't specifying that they were looking at how like um, people who are really good at memorizing compared to people who are bad at memorizing. Like A makes it sound like they're just looking at the act of memorization generalized across all types of people. I feel like it's a little bit too broad, but luckily given that this is a paired question, the evidence will point us in the right direction too. So I'm think, I think 45C, but we'll be able to know for sure pretty soon. 27 to 29. After her grandma, she's saying, okay, so not that, because that doesn't say what she's looking for. 33 to 37. They wanted to find out if the memorizer's brain, it's probably this, like the London guy is structurally different than the rest of ours or if they're somehow just making better, okay, I think that is C. Structurally different, we add normal brain structure and then, or if they're just using different like parts of their brain. Yeah, it's C. And then it would, st like, like I was saying with A, it has an issue with A because like they said specifically in that line they, that they want to know like how the memorizer, the, the good memorizer's brains compare to regular memorizers, not simply what happens when you memorize something compared to when you drive or sail or navigate. 47, as used in line 39, matched most nearly means. We should just put both mental athletes in a group of matched, like similar, comparable. Competing would be the opposite, distinguishable. There's kind of the opposite. Identical is way too strong. Okay, the main purpose of the fifth paragraph is to 57. Oh, it was to talk about the difference, right? Like that would be the annotation I wouldn't written, but based off of the first sentence. So they use different circuitry or something. It was talking about a difference, and the difference was that they used different circuitry. Where is this question? 48. Main purpose of the fifth paragraph is to okay. relate study of mental athletes to her study of time. I don't think so. It speculate on the reason for McGuire's unex I don't think speculation is something she did at all there. Identify an important finding of McGuire's study of mental athletes. Transition from a summary of McGuire's findings to descript. I think it's C. According to the passage, when compared to mental athletes, the individuals in the control group in McGuire's second study, individuals in the control group of the second study, so less brain activity overall. I know it said that the mental athletes activated different circuitry. That doesn't mean that the non-mental athletes used less brain power. They just used different areas of brain power, if that makes any sense. I feel like A is a trap. Demonstrated a wider range of cognitive ability. No, I don't think that it made them sm like smarter. Exhibited different patterns of brain. I think it might be that. Displayed noticeably sim smaller hippocampal reach. I think it's C. The passage most strongly suggests that mental athletes are successful at memorization because they, they visualize it. They turn into pictures. Exploit parts of the brain not normally used through in routine memorization. Convert information that they're trying to memorize into abstract symbols. I don't know about the symbols part. They said they're going to turn it into pictures, but I don't know abstract symbols. I'm not sure. Organize information into numerical lists prior to memorization. No. Exercise their brains regularly. No. So they said it wasn't because of that. So it's like A or B. And then find the one that, just remember that when you're stuck between two, the one that you pick indicates that you believe the other one to be false. So like, for example, if I picked B here, which I, well, that makes me feel really uncomfortable because B is not only saying that the content of B is correct. It's also saying that I think that A is wrong. I'm pretty sure they said A. So like, I'm going to go with A because I'm way more comfortable being like, yeah, I think that if A is right, that would mean B is wrong. And the issue that I could see B having is the abstract symbols part. And so yeah, just weigh, weigh the pros and cons. Oh, and it's paired. Fantastic. So we can just like make sure. 66 to 72. Paired questions are so nice. Yeah, they're like free. When mental, watch it, I'm gonna get it wrong. Yeah. Surprisingly, when mental athletes were learning new information, they were engaging several regions of the brain known to be involved in two specific tasks, visual memory and spatial navigation. Maybe, I, I, given the, did it, was there a surprising element? Maybe, is it a maybe? Yeah. 72 to 73. At first glance, this wouldn't seem to make, that's way too vague. 79 to 81. McGuire and her team asked them to, to describe what they're doing. I don't think this is in about why. What was the question for 50? Why they're successful. If you just ask them why, taken out of context, I don't know that if you're asking it as a result of them being successful. 85 to 87. They weren't doing this. On, I think it is A. Yeah, yeah. So I'm going to say 51A with 50A. So AA. Yeah brain not normally used in routine memorization. 
Yeah, I think so. I didn't see anything abstract symbols there, so. Questions in lines, well, maybe. So I was still dwelling on, I know there was like a line that was sort of talking about how they like visualized it or something, but then there was something that I noticed about that I kind of want to point out. There was, which one was it? Unless I'm just clearly out of my mind, this wouldn't make any sense. Hmm. I, I, it was like maybe 51D, like I could see a student possibly trying to match that with like 50B. Is it like, oh, like that's what, it says that they, were, they weren't doing this automatically. And this is referring to kind of like the uh, using the abstract symbols or whatever. Uh, because, right, but then it's like, you wanna take that line just out of, almost out of context. Like you wanna make sure that the line itself provides the evidence, not w without supporting evidence from elsewhere. And then so that's what makes me think that like D can't be the right answer because D it's set, like 51D doesn't provide me an answer for 50s question. So even if I thought it paired with one of 50s answers, it's really important to remember that if we look at question 50 here, the answer choices are all starting with like lowercase letters, like exploit parts of the brain, convert information, organize information, all that stuff. So a lot of times when I'm like teaching students, I'll be like, hey, you know, student one, can you please read answer choice A? And then they'll be like, oh, exploit parts of the body. I'll be like, nope, it's not what it says. And then they'll look at me like I'm crazy. But what I'm trying to point out there is that somewhat facetiously, is that answer choice A is meant to plug into the directions of 50s. You're supposed to read it as, the passage most strongly suggested that mental athletes are successful at memorization because they exploit parts of the brain not normally used in routine memorization, period. That's why they have that terminal punct punctuation there at the end of each answer choice. So if you, when you're picking a line that supports answer 50A, you have to make sure that it also mentions the stuff that's in 50s question because that's part of 50A. So that's why I thought 51D was like kind of iffy. It doesn't match the first half of the answer, the one in the directions. Okay, the question in line 74, 78, primarily serve two. Why would mental athletes be, okay, is it to ask why would they be doing that? It's pretty straightforward, I think. Raise doubts? No, they're just curious, right? Emphasize and elaborate on an initial puzzling result of a study of mental, maybe? Imply that McGuire's findings undermine two negative, introduce and explain a connection between McGuire's two studies. Why would wondering something emphasize a connection between two studies and her early... Also, where was the earlier work? I know she did... It started with her London Cabby study, right? So then, isn't earlier work unmentioned? It's inaccurate wording. Inaccurate wording all over the test. Yes, I, mean, I think that this is B. Cool. All right. Section one done. Section two coming right up.